Yeah, so welcome uh, Dr. Stuart Barber to the Esquite Mobile Learning Special Interest Group and uh, Stuart's from the University of Melbourne and uh, works uh, uh, in biosciences there and has done a fair bit of work in virtual reality, particularly around uh, virtual field trips for farms. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing about his projects today and having a bit of discussion around them and, and uh, perhaps getting some ideas. So thanks, Stuart. Thanks very much, Tom. So, so look, I'm, I'm, I'm based in the, in the Melbourne Vet School, so I guess that's where, where my framework for this comes from, teaching into both vet science and also um, agricultural science. Um, so my, my background is I'm, I'm a, I used to be a practicing vet, um, but now I'm uh, teaching and researching in that vet and ag space. Um, what I might do, I might just share my screen. Bear with one second while I just... Uh, was a too many screen, sorry. All right, hopefully that's showing you a front screen with a nice picture of canola, fingers crossed. It's uh, when about it, to, it comes hopefully. <laughs> Always takes a little while. Thanks oh, so much for my internet connection being good uh, earlier. It seems to have slowed down now. <laughs> um, and, and so I guess what, what when I started teaching in the well, mid-late 2000s um, in the vet school at Melbourne Uni, um, we, we always take students on, on, on so working out great. We, we take students on field trips onto properties. Or certainly when we were a, a smaller faculty, we used to do that relatively regularly. And as the schools got bigger, that's become more, more challenging. Um, and so when I came back to teach um, the first year or so, I probably did it much as, as, as though it had been done before, um, but recognized we weren't getting the same level of understanding in our students. Um, and I guess if I just hopefully go to the next slide. Oh, hang on. Um, when we were looking at the assessment outcomes from our learning outcomes, we really weren't getting the results that we were after for our students. Um, they were coming with answers that just didn't make sense uh, in terms of from an agricultural point of view, um, because the students didn't have the background um, from that area. So a lot of the things that might've been assumed 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, students weren't coming into that course with that knowledge. And so we needed to work out how we could actually um, teach them those things that a lot of people in rural areas would think of being as common sense, but really are learned understanding. Um, so we wanted some tools to help students gain better experience, both while they're on campus, but also while they were off campus. So our students also have to do work on farms. They have to do 12 weeks of work over two years in their holidays. And I put inverted commas around those holidays. Um, and so part of that is being safe on those properties. Um, and also when they go there, having enough understanding that they um, are, um, they look as though they know what they're talking about from a farming point of view. So the farmers include them in what they're doing. I should know, I'm very happy for people to jump in and ask questions as we, as we go. Um, so um, yell out if you have a question. If I've not so, so I guess, I mean, uh, are you saying, um, Stuart, that, that effectively your students uh, had less experience of farms than they previously did? Um... Absolutely, Tom. So we've gone from being, probably there'll be one degree of separation. When, when I went through as a student, probably 80% would have known someone who worked on a farm or they might have been from the farm themselves. Now that would be about 15%. Um, only about... 10% of our students have been on a farm before they start their vet degree now. Um, well, sorry, 10% would have had any significant time on farms. Maybe 30% would have visited a farm, but quite a lot won't have physically seen a sheep or a cow. Yeah, I find that quite surprising, particularly, you know, obviously if they're in, intending on a career <laughs> that involves being on farms that, uh, you know, they haven't invested any time in that previously. Um, yeah, so so we, we, we do have quite a lot of students who are looking at, you know, dog and cat and small animal and wildlife. Um, but certainly for me, it was a matter of reframing my thought processes around how we taught because it is a quite a big difference, uh, as you say, that that lack of 
background, I guess, which used to be something that was assumed. Um, so we started looking for tools back in the late 2000s, and there really wasn't a lot around um, at that time. It was quite difficult to find things then. Uh, and, and just to, I guess, note this point, um, most of, of um, Western countries are, are now sitting on around about 90% um, population in, in um, urban areas and about 10% ballpark in rural. Um, so it probably shouldn't be too surprising that most of our students come in unless we select very heavily towards rural backgrounds without much rural experience. Um, and the Primary Industries Education Foundation of Australia has run some surveys over the past 10 years um, and pretty low levels of self-rated knowledge from students. Um, and, you know, for example, ha having the understanding, I think 30% of secondary school students don't think that yogurt is an animal product. Um, and similarly around uh, denim cotton jeans, don't think that's a plant product. So when you look at that, you recognise there's some issues in terms of the educational process, not just at university, but also going back into primary school, which is, I guess I'll, I'll talk about shortly as well. But um, this, I guess, has been driving my thoughts around trying to build some better tools for use to try and help this, this area. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so you know, big shift to population. So historically, there was a much um, bigger percentage of population in rural areas, uh, and that's really pushing Every five or ten years, there's another you know, part of a percent that moves into the large cities rather than rural areas. We also have a lot of um, extra international students in the last 10 to 20 years as well. So we need to be cognizant of that when we're designing um, our material. Uh, and as, as I was saying, less general knowledge, which most of our farmers would refer to as common sense. Um, but from my point of view, is, a, is learned knowledge. So that, that's, I guess, the, the background and the scene setting for how we came to looking at virtual reality as a, as a potential tool to try and improve learning. Uh, and this is just looking at the, the, some of those um, survey results from um, the students responding. So 17% uh, of students think that bacon is made from a non-animal product, which is, I don't quite know how you come to that thought. And again, this is secondary school students. There, there is um, vegan bacon though, isn't there, you know? There, there certainly is, and it generally is defined as, as not it'd be called v-bacon or a different <laughs> word for that but you're, you're quite right tom um mm. and i think that does lead to some of the confusion because you have a lot of products they they in terms of their naming it does cause some confusion um even when you go down to a, a woolen rug um you know 42 percent of students not thinking that's an animal-based product which is concerning given the name but anyway I, I won't spend too much time on that just making the point that it's a a challenge all the way through schooling before university. Um, so a four-day virtual farm, which we started in 2011, I want to make that clear because it's now relatively old. So it, it's um, it, it's quite amazing how far things have moved in the past nine years. Um, so I feel like I'm talking about something that's very old tech now. Looking at that, um, so the name four-day virtual farm. Our images actually we don't record in 3D, so we just use a a, um, a single panorama rather than um, dual lenses. Um, but we add in the time element into all of our uh, images on farm, so people can see in the full 360, and then they can see through time as well. So that's where the the 4D comes from. It's a little bit cheating because it's not technically 3D in the first place; it's just a flat panorama. Um, but that's where the original name came from back in 2011. Um, and again, the reason for doing this, we take our students out to properties and what you can hopefully see on the screen there, uh, on the left image is a really nice sunny day where we've got a busload of students and a few staff at a, an alpaca property. Um, they're all happy in the middle one. And on the right hand side, you can see an image with around about 25 millimetres of rain falling in around about seven or eight minutes. Um, as a combination of hail and rain. And the students are actually standing under a shed, but the rain was going from one side to the other. So days like that, we don't get a whole lot of learning. We just get sad, cold, wet students um, trying to not get hurt too much by the hail. Um, so again, I guess the reason for this, again, assessment wise, we really wanted our students to have a good understanding of these systems where they might work when they graduate. 
Uh, and students mostly really love our property visits, but we wanted to be able to help them learn prior to the visits so they could actually understand better and then be able to reflect when they came back from those visits. Um, also as a way to help if we had you know, obviously bad weather on some of those visits, which is obviously going to happen at various times. So from my point of view, certainly we'd ideally like to always do field trips uh, and that continues as, as the gold standard. So I don't want to suggest that we're not looking at doing um, you know, face to face and field trips. Uh, I think that is the ideal. The challenges with that, probably the biggest one is, is cost. Um, every day of taking students on the road is probably going to cost you know, $10,000. So it's not cheap to do. Uh, the time for that, both in terms of staff and drivers and accommodation and food and all that sort of thing is, is quite significant. Um, we get a difference of ha how students experience that. So we don't take all students to one properly on the same day. And so it might be quite a different experience for some students on one day versus the next group the next day, just based on weather um, or on who from the farm might be able to see us on that day. Um, Another key one for us is biosecurity. So often we actually can't get onto properties. So a lot of piggeries and chicken farms have very stringent biosecurity and it can mean we can't get onto the actual property. And, and that's, I guess, one of the key things where a virtual field trip is very, very useful because it means we can still um, you know, visit those properties at least in VR to uh, see how they function, whereas we can't do that face-to-face. Um, -face. So when we set out to design it, um, really needed to be easy to use uh, because a lot of people using it in terms of lecturing staff wouldn't have had a lot of experience and the same as students. Um, it had to be viewable in different environments and platforms. We knew a lot of our um, staff and students used a range of whether it be Android or iPhone or PC or um, uh, Apple environments. Um, and originally when we were looking at this project, I think we were quoted around about $200,000 to change it from being Apple only to being um, multiple system. Um, but thankfully that changed as we went, as we went through the program. Uh, it needed to be something that we could edit over time. Uh, it had to allow us to see that change through time. One of the big problems our students had was understanding that process of what changes happen on a farm through time. Uh, and that was a constant thing in the assessment we get back that was causing issues. Uh, we did want to be able to add in multimedia over the top of um, the 4D farm. Uh, and I guess we've been looking at around for a few years and I happened to run into David Shellcross, who works in chemical engineering at the University of Melbourne. And he'd been doing work with a consortium around Australia on um, delivering virtual reality and chemical engineering. So they've been looking at how a plant is built and operated uh, and done some early work in that. So that was a really useful starting point from our point of view. <coughs> We had some initial money from a Collier grant to help us go and image one property, which we did with David. And then we were successful in getting an OLT grant, so the Office of Learning and Teaching, um, which uh, was finished about well, four years ago. I think that whole um, area was closed. We had that grant um, and the unions you can see down the bottom there collaborated on that. Um, so from New Zealand at Massey, across the WA, and then up the Eastern Seaboard as well. Um, so that allowed a distribution of workload. It meant we could gain access to local properties um, and develop tools. We're going to work across all the Australasian vet schools. So the goal was to produce a, an output that would be usable both in the ag and vet schools around Australasia. Uh, and I guess the other thing we, we looked initially before we started this at the learning outcomes we wanted to achieve from the tool that we were developing. That then determined where we would take the photos on the property. So that's a, a lot of background there. So I apologize for all the background. Uh, in terms of what we've been doing, um, so on the original 4D farm, we took around about 25 photos um, on each property. Um, and so you can see uh, a topographical uh, map there on the right with just a distribution where we took images on, on one property. Um, so at each single image, we take seven images at three exposures uh, to get the full 360 using a uh, Nikon D800 with a fisheye lens. Um, and we've returned to that same spot using a GPS on each farm um, for each season. 
So we ended up in that project with around about 21,000 um, images um, that were then put into that whole database of images, if you like, to um, display as those uh, panoramas. We also um, captured uh, other video and images while we were there to use as overlays. Uh, I'm probably not telling anyone different to what you'd already know, but in terms of the, each image, we'd have those seven images at or 21 because we have a, an exposure above and below those shots you can see there. Um, and that just gets melded together to form the equirectangular, uh, as you can see there, which is our panorama you'll see uh, within the 4D Farms site. Uh, a few challenges, I guess, that works really nicely in a nice, um, uh, you know, scene with no animals, but for us, where we might have quite a lot of animals moving, you do end up with quite a few half cows or half sheep and that sort of stuff. So there the can be quite a lot of editing needed to fix that up in some of our images on this, because we start on, on you know, looking north, for example, and as we swept around the whole panorama that the cow or the sheep or pig or whatever it might be moves, and, and obviously there's some work needed to, um, to fix those up. Um, towards the end of that project, um, some of the new um, dual lens or, or multi-lens cameras were starting to come out that were taking over from the DSLR a little bit. Um, you can see, oops, sorry, that wasn't what I meant to do. Bear with me for a second. Okay. You can see Evan over here, so that's the... Um, the camera on the tripod there doing the uh, original filming. Um, and again, a whole range of new cameras have, were arriving at the end of the project. Most of them didn't really have the quality we needed for these images. So one of the key things we wanted with these images was high quality. So people would actually enjoy looking at them and be able to zoom in and see different structures. So at, at that time, there were no other, I guess, single easy sort of point of shoot cameras um, that you could take anywhere near the same quality of, of image as what we could with the DSLR. So I just realized there might be some questions there, which I didn't see, I apologize. Um, so just jumping back to a question from Tom, which I missed. Um, potential now for students to create their own virtual field trips as assessments. So up till now, we haven't got them to create their own in terms of physically using a 360 camera. Um, and part of that's been around access to enough cameras to do that. Uh, certainly it is quite feasible now. Um, and there's a number of, so cameras like the Mesphere, for example, are relatively cheap. And so we could actually potentially have a few of those, but we wouldn't have enough for all of the students. So I guess that's our, our big challenge uh, and equally, most of those dual lens cameras are inherently um, very simple to break. Um, if you don't have them well secured on a tripod, um, they're very easy to break, which is yeah, not ideal. So that's our current challenge, um, unless they were to do it using their phone um, on, a, on a tripod to actually take a whole lot of images to then stitch those together. Um, <coughs> so there are, there are ways I could do it. Uh, what we have done is actually get them to go into the 4D farms and provide a report from that. So utilise that as a resource to capture images and demonstrate their knowledge and learning from that, which I'll, I'll come to in a second. Oops. Um, so in terms of the elements on the screen that we added into this, you can see an equirectangular image um, there. So that's at a farm up in New South Wales, uh, so near the sheep yards. Um, one of the key things we wanted the students to be able to do was to orient themselves. So you have a compass in the top right, so you can see what direction you're looking at at all times. Um, there's a number of elements in here. So we have window panes. This little uh, window pane symbol here brings up these windows that show you all the actual photos on the property. Then we have this world map symbol, which brings up the actual property and where those um, photos have been taken. So you can move around the property clicking on these little dots, or you can move around using these window panes, or you can move around using these arrows, which take you to the next nearest photo in that direction. Um, so this is all done using KR Pano. Um, you can move around 
I'll move your vision around using the arrows here and you can zoom in or out um, by these functions here. Is that all web-based, uh, Stuart, it's or do you need to? It's 100% web-based, yep. yes, all, all WebGL. Um, then up here, you can see the different um, times we've visited. So you can scroll down that using your mouse and, and just select the time that you want. Uh, what you see on the bottom here is an, an addition we've put in where we actually have, in this case, we have the rainfall over time. Uh, and this dotted line you can see here corresponds to the time we've actually visited to take those photos. Uh, and if we go over here, we actually can drop down temperature as well. So you can see the rainfall and temperature throughout the year, um, the time we visit, and also that you know, preceding rainfall and temperature. Um, so that was a, I guess a reason it probably took about 12 months to get all that um, sorted out and, and uh, functioning well. At the start of when we built this, so this all happened 12 months prior to the first Oculus coming out, the old, uh, the DK1. Um, and, and so we, we put it into that, the VR version then um, towards the end of this project. Um, so initially it was just looking at flat screen and or cardboard use, but it can also function in, in Oculus. So what I've just put on the screen here, um, is the same um, or part of a 360 image, uh, just showing those different times of the year. So again, you can see the same sort of water, same water trough in each shot, um, and obviously cattle are there in spring, but in summertime, there's no grass have been moved off that pasture. Uh, they're back there in autumn, but they're a smaller animal, uh, and that paddock's being rested during winter. So it lets the students, and again, you can you can choose whether you're looking at either uh, rainfall, which is the top two inches, or um, or temperature, which is minimum and maximum temperatures in the, in the bottom two images. So that's what that's what a student can see working through. If I if I click from spring, summer, autumn, winter, that's the sort of thing they'd see. And again, they can move throughout that full 360 uh, within each each time point within each uh, visit. Uh, and similarly, if, if they were to jump between properties, so we imaged um, 11 properties around Australasia. So you can see there's a West Australian property on the top left in summertime. Um, and WA in that Wheatfield area is very dry then, as you can probably hopefully uh, see. Um, Queensland, again, in, in dry season, looking relatively dry in the top right. Um, Victoria in the bottom left, uh, relatively flat on a dairy in Gippsland. And then New Zealand in um, not too far from uh, Massey, so on the North, North Island, um, showing some fairly mountainous country, not too far from Mount Ruapayu for those that know that part of the country. So um, have you um, done anything with sound uh, within these environments as well, Stuart? So it's actually a really good point, Tom, and something that we should have done and didn't do was capture sound on each day that we were there because um, I now consider sound as actually a really important element, which we will add into future versions, but unfortunately at that time we, we didn't. Um, and equally at, at the time, it was a little bit more tricky to bring some of that into some of the, the, um, the software, but certainly I, I would really like to have it now as each image comes up, the sound for that day would come up as well, would be an ideal outcome. Um, because it certainly does help from the work we've done since. But for this actual version, we don't have it. Um, so it's all web-based um, and runs happily on, um, it certainly runs best on um, Firefox or, or Chrome. Um, in most cases, they tend to be less buggy, but all mobile devices it runs on happily, uh, whether it be Mac or Windows um, and similarly on Oculus as well. Uh, so we, we did transfer into, into a VR compatible version. Um, so the split splits off left and right eye uh, and runs happily um, on that. Um, so as I said, the difference is the, the extra things we added in, uh, and these are really a PC or, or a, a desktop or laptop version is the weather data. So in the actual VR version or the mobile version that doesn't come up because it makes the screen too busy. Um, 
extra videos again, photos, some text. So we, we built a, a glossary, so a PHP database glossary, which I'll show you in a second that students can click on. That takes them to the time um, and position on the farm where that element is being shown. So for example, it might be a, a header in a paddock and them seeing how that header functions to actually take a, take a crop off, for example. Um, and additionally, linking it to assessment so we can use this in iframes for you know, multiple choice questions, whatever it might be. Oops. Sorry. Just lost my mouse, bear with me. All right. Um, so, so certainly one of the key things you wanted out of this was a, um, an environment health and, health and safety or occupation health and safety tool uh, in that farms are one of the more dangerous places for students or for anyone to work. Uh, there's a, a relatively high de death rate, I think it's second behind mining, um, as well as injuries. Um, so you can see in the top left, that's the New Zealand place uh, and off in the distance here, you can see that's a four wheel motorbike. Um, and you can probably imagine how uh, riding that sort of equipment on that hill country can be fairly dangerous. So uh, equally working in confined spaces, like you can see these silos here. Um, so they're quite big silos. They're obviously a confined space and again, quite dangerous if students don't understand the potential risks in working in those. So um, having some teaching and learning activities we can build around that. Uh, similarly, tractors also tend to be one of the more dangerous things on farms. Uh, as well as working with livestock who can also be dangerous as well. So um, just those standard images are a really nice tool to start that conversation and then potentially go into some other um, videos that we can play over the top of that area or take them off into other learning um, areas where they go through that. Certainly um, the, uh, the amount of accidents on farms in New Zealand with uh, you know, the four wheel drive uh, bikes, um, four wheelers is, is quite high. Um, yeah. In, in lots of incidents of, uh, you know, children or farmers uh, having accidents or killing themselves, um, you know, so that's that's quite a high risk activity as well. Yeah, look, it's, I think, unfortunately, in Australia this year, there's been six or seven deaths so far. And, and most years you see more than 10 people killed on, on motorbikes on farms. Uh, and, and often it is kids. So yes, ab absolutely. Um, and certainly for vet students that haven't been to farms before, um, you know, they need to have that understanding and, and going through this kind of process can really help before they, they again visit those farms. Um, so one of the things to help with that, so I should, should mention that a lot, the vast majority of the actual technical work done on this was done by Evan Helene, who I worked with on this. Um, so he built a, a PHP database that lets us um, uh, Again, put in any image or video or text onto a particular site um, on the 4D farms. Um, that takes, so if you're looking at the, the database as an actual list, you click on that and it takes, to, it takes you to that spot on the farm with that overlay at that time of the year in that, um, wherever you want the person to look. Similarly, we also have a, a, a point location tool where, for example, if I want to show something in a lecture, I can, grab that web address, um, paste that into my presentation, and it actually brings up that specific point in time at that direction at the Zoom function to allow me to go straight to the point I want to be at rather than have to click through lots of different parts of the 4D farm to get there, um, which makes it much easier from a teaching point of view and, and a lot more user friendly to, um, to do that. Um, equally, I've been put in an editor for that um, glossary so that it's very easy to add material into it. Um, saves me having to have a lot of coding knowledge in the background. So I can just use a, a fairly simple editor to add things into that as can other members of the team. Um, so how have you used the 4D farm so far? I certainly used it a fair bit in iframe in, in, in our old Blackboard system and now Canvas. Um, we did have it um, in Smart Sparrow as well uh, until Smart, Smart Sparrow was um, uh, removed. Uh, again, I use, use it in lectures and case studies uh, as students have full access to it to use as a, as a revision and reflection tool from their visits um, as they go around as well. 
Um, we haven't done this too much yet, but certainly in terms of, uh, uh, of one potential use as a, as a treasure hunt, if you like, to find certain elements uh, and screenshot them as a demonstration. The students actually has found certain elements on the property and understood why they exist at certain times, for example. Um, so they have to go through both around the whole farm to understand that, but then also through time to see what happens um, throughout the year. So that, uh, I just want to quickly add on to that. So the, the 4D farms um, was a real advancement for us. I guess Dookie VR is our, our next level version of that. It's been funded by the Melbourne Network Society. Uh, and the team you can see there again with um, Evan on board then Ben Loveridge from Learning Environments, uh, Ben Crunan, who's done our photogrammetry. Uh, and then also working with the Centre for the Study of Higher Education and Melbourne Graduate School of Education as well. Um, so Dookie's just our uh, University of Melbourne farm in Northern Victoria. Um, there's a dairy and a sheep cropping enterprise are the major two enterprises there, uh, along with a fair bit of research on the farm. So it's both commercial and a, and a teaching property. And so the goal really for Dookie VR is to bring, is to try and I guess reduce that urban rural divide, certainly for our students, but hopefully more broadly, once I can start taking into, into primary and secondary schools, um, looking at trying to reduce that gap in knowledge uh, um, and giving primary school and secondary school teachers um, more tools to help explain some of those things that is clearly um, knowledge lacking. So I guess a key thing for this was, was, was the changes in tech that had happened in, in the intervening years. So we started this in 2018. Um, as I said, we've been using the DSLR camera, you can see in that top image. Um, whilst that gave us really high quality images, it did take quite a bit of time to stitch those images. And there was a fair bit of post-production work to make them look as they should. Uh, when we started doing VKBR, we opted to move to using Panono, which is, this little softball size bit of kit with 36 cameras, um, <clears throat> which is fantastic because it takes um, all the photos at once. And so it doesn't matter as much as animals move. Um, so that was a real step forward. It's also automatically stitched online. Um, my concern around that uh, model when I bought the Panono was that if they wanted to, they could suddenly start charging money for stitching which they said they wouldn't do, but then after nine months, they then did start charging money for stitching um, at about $1.60 a photo. They stitched you up. They stitched us up, which was not, an, to be honest, wasn't a massive shock. <laughs> um, but yes, they did. Uh, and so there was mass anger on every known Facebook site, site for uh, the Panono. Um, but thankfully, at the same time, x -Vase Pro uh, released this, hand grenade looking piece of kit right here, which while it's only a 25 lens camera actually takes a, a better quality overall image. Um, it's a little bit clunky to use because there's some challenges around how it's um, uh, getting, getting to know how to use it, um, but a really high quality stitch all done on your own computer. Um, and so um, we move from the Panono onto the x -Face. Um, for that reason. You can actually run models to sit to Panono not using the cloud server, but they're again a fair bit of work. Um, so actually much better HDR quality uh, and we're also using the One X, which is this one just here, and yesterday the One X2 got released, so it's an upgraded version of this, and then the Kandao 8K, the video, uh, the 360 video work. Uh, then we use a, map, a, a, a Matic Pro to do um, 360, 360 aerial. So the Mavic takes about 21 images uh, and that gets stitched together as you can see in that image there. Oh, and that's just showing that again, that, um, that time element. So summertime, um, that one's early spring. Uh, sorry, no, that's late autumn. Um, so a uh, challenge for us has been over that longest period of time picking the right equipment to try and get those bets right. We certainly got some of them right and got some of them wrong. Um, there's certainly better gear around than what we're currently using. So we could go with something like the Insta Pro. This is Insta Pro 2 actually. Um, but you're talking, you know, seven and a half thousand dollars or more for that. Or if we went with the um, Titanium, that's about fourteen thousand dollars, I think. Um, for what we're looking at doing, um, so the Candow and the the Insta one are, are actually good for that because they're smaller, so they fit in spaces better for us. 
Um, and also I can cover them. So at the end of doing work, I can wash that whole ear because I'll put an actual cover around that camera. You can't cover a large camera like the Insta Pro 2. Um, again, massively changing space. So that's one of our biggest challenges, just keeping up to date with what, what's the optimal equipment for the right price. Uh, and then making sure we use that so we can share it with students in a way that works for the students, because that's the key thing at the end of the day is getting content that, that is viewable by students in the right way to achieve those, those learning outcomes. Oh, I just wanted to show, this is um, just a, an early phase one. This is an image of some of the photogrammetry of the Dookie Shearing Shed by Ben Coonan. And if I can just get this up. Again, this is a low resolution fly around. Um, he's taken around about 3000 images. And so there should be a, a, um, a fully VR compatible walkthrough of the, um, the shearing shed, um, which looks, so this is an earlier image. The, the newer ones look quite stunning. The quality is um, amazing. Um, so that, that sort of thing combined, whoops, it wasn't what I wanted to do. That sort of thing combined with other tools on the farm in the long, long run um, should hopefully bring a, a lot more interactivity into the, uh, the elements as well. Um, certainly for this year, there's been a lot more use of, the, of these tools, both Duke VR and the 4D farms. Um, so the ag faculty has been used as an online ag case study. And most of that was actually the lecturer taking images out of the 4D, out of Duke VR to use them. He wanted to be quite directed in what the students were doing. Um, we have run a, an across university virtual extramural work um, program with students as well. So in December and January, we'll have about 500 students going through um, placements because we can't get students on the farms yet. Uh, we'll be utilizing the virtual farms as, as a background for that with a lot of other material overlaid on top of it for the actual images through time of, of the 40 farms provides the backdrop. Um, so it's been a really useful tool. And again, mostly students are using it um, as, as a screen based version rather than in VR. If they have a Google Cardboard, they could be doing VR, but most of them, or some, some would have a Google uh, Cardboard, but a lot don't. Um, so we haven't been pushing him into that direction in the short term. In the longer term, that may happen. Um, but again, it's quite usable across um, any of those, those areas. I guess future plans. Uh, so finishing that photogrammetry, um, adding in extra elements, potentially looking at shearing in virtual reality. So we do have complete scans of sheep using a CAT scan and looking at building up a full 3D sheep. Um, that's in process, We're just being held back a bit by lack of access to the computer I'm using for that. Uh, we want to further gamify some elements on Dookie VR. Uh, with the library of images we'll have from that, um, there's about 130 hotspots or 130 panoramas taken on Dookie, and I'm visiting there about once every six weeks. So we get a, a massive resource in terms of images that we can use. So we can use those to actually gamify um, decision making for our students and show them how things might change with the decisions they make. Um, similarly, adding further elements to the glossary module to help students understanding with that as well. So we're only part way into it, but it's a, so it's, it's a big step forward now, certainly a lot easier to do what we're doing now. It, it takes a lot less time um, and really looking at trying to do this across more properties. Um, and building more education for different age groups, I guess, to make that more available. Um, I've, I've run for a long time there and been talking lots. Um, so future plans, I guess, for development, certainly <clears throat> LiDAR capture, um, yes, and, and that's something we want to investigate, uh, I suppose, at, at both broad scale, but also looking at doing some smaller scale um, captures in certain areas to bring those to life. Um, we, I should be doing um, research publications right now. I'm, I'm trying to get other teaching stuff done and this, this year has been hectic, but certainly there's uh, three papers in, in motion at the moment around development of the farm, looking at survey data from students who are doing these um, placements to actually look at what are the actual learning outcomes, what are students' perceptions and staff perceptions of how well the tool actually functions. Um, to assess that, to then 
um, look at its use and similarly looking at doing that similar thing in primary and secondary schools as well. Again, that's it's a longer term project because it takes more human ethics to get through that process. Um, but that is certainly the, um, the goal. Uh, and, and so certainly the more, <laughs> the ability to move around um, with the user choosing exactly where that point is would, would be fantastic. It's just a matter of the working out the technology around that and the physical limitations to that. Um, I guess part of that being bandwidth, uh, and that's something we haven't actually investigated yet, um, but, but certainly there has some benefits. Equally, if we can restrict students to looking at specific areas where we have specific learning outcomes, that can minimise the amount of time. It's very easy to spend oh, at least an hour in the four day farms and not know where the time's gone because you're looking around through time and space and getting, and so, so potentially having a lot more space to examine whilst it has some benefits, it may also have some negatives with it as well. Um, but yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, some just more. sort of thinking, uh, you know, the ability for the user to be able to choose their point of view or be able to move around, um, you know, within that environment beyond, uh, you know, with a 360 image, you, you've got a static point of view. Um, you can zoom in and out, but uh, you can't, you know, you can and turn around, but you can't change where that point of view is. Yeah, look, uh, absolutely. And, and I think that's, it'd be nice to do that. But the challenge is the extra time and cost, I guess, in, involved in, yeah, in yeah, doing that. Yeah, sort of thinking, you know, because you know, I've seen some, some um, haven't, haven't used it myself, but I've uh, been seeing some demonstrations of LiDAR over the last couple of years. And certainly the, the cost of it has come down exponentially. Yep. Um, and but the key key I suppose at this point is still the uh, amount of data involved and the bandwidth around that. But but once again, you know, that, that's all changing as well quite rapidly. Look, I, I think there's a lot a lot of potential in those areas coming up. Um, I'm just trying to get one of these images to actually show you how this works. If I can. But yeah, I mean, what, what you created is fantastic. And I think it's uh, it's great that it's actually been a longitudinal study as well. So, you know, nine years of work, uh, that's quite significant. And um, really encourage you and the team to be writing that up, you know, share what you've done, uh, get it out there, um, you know, use it as a framework for other people to build on or, or you know, by reflecting on what you've done, uh, really establish some really key design principles that it doesn't matter what the technology is, yeah, it's the goal. It's the outcomes that you're after, and so you know, being getting your stake in the ground around those design principles, which you you must have established by now, uh, getting them out there in the literature. You know, Look, hundred percent. And, and so certainly, it's been something that's been on the agenda for obviously quite a long time. Um, and of course, I mean, the team was very chuffed. So I think in 2015, we um, were placed in the Australian Innovation Awards. Um, yeah, going back then again a lot of things have changed obviously in that time so it was quite novel when this whole program started whereas now 360 imaging is becoming more and more simple and, and to, so it means there's a lot more chance for this to be done well by a, a bigger range of people who don't have a lot of extensive experience so yeah uh, i'm just going to try and bring another slide uh, right there with me So I'll see if this actually, I do know it seems to be taking quite a long time to load up. Yeah, there was quite a delay in your uh, screen coming yeah. through. Uh, it may, may well be. All right, so in theory, that should be coming up shortly. So what I'm putting on the screen now is just a shot of, of, of Dookie VR to show you what it looks like in the, in the real um, place. And again, it seems for some reason on Zoom, it does seem to take a long time to load up um, the 4 day farms, not sure why. Okay, we can see it now. You can see it now. So, uh, and again, it's quite laggy as I move around, but hopefully what you'll see over the next 10 seconds or so is you can see that it, it moves around. So this is actually a, a drone shot looking down the farm and I've just opened up the, um, the farm map. Has that come up yet? But might take the same amount of time to come up, I suspect. Uh, we've got a like a map overlay on the... Yep. 
So we're currently looking at the, the drone shots where, uh, where's my little picker? Uh, the drone shot is that shot just there. I'll just move us down to this hotspot down here, which is a, gro a ground based shot. I'll get rid of that map for the moment. So do the colours on the map indicate the type of shot? Yeah, so on, on that map, the green based dots are all our, our ground based shots uh, and the pinkish hue are the drone shots. And so the other thing obviously we can do on this map is there's a whole lot of other elements which I'll just open them so you can see what they all look like. So I've just changed all the elements over to show that the, the um, different dates that have been taken there. You can see um, some of the windows. Again, we can scroll through all the windows there, but that shows some of them. Um, and you can see all, all the controls there. We can change that rainfall map to a, a temperature map if we want to. Um, and we are looking at adding in the production indices for the farm onto that same map. So it'd be how much milk the cows are producing on a daily basis throughout the year as well. Um, and again, we can put more onto there, but we don't want to overload the, the whole area too much. Um, so how, how many um, teaching staff use, use the 40 um, farm stewards Is that, uh, you know, yourself plus? That's a good question in terms of total number of staff. It's being used at Massey, Queensland, Sydney, Charles Sturt, Melbourne, uh, Muresk, Ag College, um, so are no, you not, just uh, sharing that with them for free or are they you know licensing it off you or how's that working so it was all built built with OLT funding um, and so we we just share that with those schools so it's a, it's a free um, thing at this point in time um, I mean, the real costs there are in just maintaining the server and and um, uh, um, any any issues that might arise um, but we are continually, I guess, updating some of those areas as well in terms of the glossary and those sorts of things as we see things we'd like to add to it. Um, but trying to maintain that community to keep building that further. So I guess Dookie VR is just our own project at University of Melbourne, whereas the 4D Farms has been that collaborative across university approach, which the OLT allowed, um, which was, I think, one of the great things about the OLT before it was um, disbanded. So what sort of... Um service space is it taking up then uh it's a it's a it's a moderate amount of space um i couldn't tell you off the top of my head it's on a virtual server at the university and i couldn't tell you exactly tom but it's it's a significant amount of space um and do qvr would be a significant increase in space over the 4d farms because so there's 130 ish photos each day uh, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, 12 days in that year, then another four days after that. So there's a few thousand fairly high resolution images um, in there, plus other videos as well. So you're not yeah. under pressure from IT to, you know, limit uh, the, the size of you know, the service space you're taking up? Look, at, at the, the, the big problem comes in when, when I, which I haven't done yet, I haven't uploaded many 360 videos. Yeah. Um, and, and these photos are nothing. As soon as I start loading in 5.7K 360 videos, they just chew up space. Um, so we have to be really selective with any of those just to not utilize too much space. And, and again, a lot of the videos we have on this, for example, we have time lapse over two months showing the grass growing and then being eaten and then being, and then growing again. So that kind of stuff, we can crunch that down to a relatively short video. Um, so yeah, and then of course the other the other issue is the bandwidth for the students. You know, if they're they're absolutely. remote at home, then uh, they don't want to be waiting half an hour for a video to load. No, and and so three sixty videos, we wouldn't upload anything. Um, uh, look, you can run four K, but it becomes challenging on a lot of bandwidth issues. So we uh, often only upload in HD, but if, if we're trying to show fine detail, that's not much use. So it really depends on what the purpose of each individual video is as to what we would put up um, but it can be really difficult to stream some of that stuff yeah it's, it's so um, are there any, any any other questions for people tom worthington has got his hand up uh yes i was just wondering um will 
will some of this use of tech flow on to the way the graduates carry out their, their job? So, you know, might they um, do a remote consultation on a farm where the farmer holds a camera up to the cow, um, <laughs> like, like veterinary telemedicine? So look, that's actually been happening a bit during lockdown. So I know a number of vets have actually got their farmers with their iPhones or Androids or whatever out in the paddock doing a, you know, FaceTiming or whatever with their sick animals, healthy animals, whatever it might be through that process. Certainly what we have been doing, even in the clinical hospital, for example, is doing 360 video of procedures to help students learn that might not see that procedure, for example. And again, that kind of thing can be kept local so you're not trying to display 4k footage via the internet it's kept on the local computer so students can see that you know at, at university but equally um we have been streaming some stuff or one of the other lectures has been streaming some 360s to students during um lockdown looking at anesthetics and surgery and that sort of thing and so i think um that will become more common as students are more exposed to it and less scared of it it's probably likely to become far more commonplace and, and as well as costs coming down quite dramatically. You know, costs, costs coming down, quality going up. You know, for $1,000, you can get a camera now that is, you know, point and shoot, click a button, off you go, and um, you can stream to the web through YouTube or, yeah, other sources. So um, longer terms, certainly, I think that sort of thing will become more common. So another yeah. aspect uh, along that sort of line is, you know, the use of drones with cameras. Um, so you can go and virtually, you know, check out your stock, where they are, their movements, is, is there any stock in trouble, et cetera. Uh, I suppose part of the limitation with the drones is the uh, battery life and how long they can, you know, the distance, et cetera. But, you know, for example, in say paramedicine, drones are being used to check out accident sites and make sure they're safe or, you know, is, is there actually some, someone alive in that car, et cetera, you know. Yeah, and look, certainly the drone shots can be, I think, really, really useful and, and help to get that overview on, on our area. What, one of the challenges we face with that often is just some of the legalities around that and, and location of property. So one of our properties is within five kilometres of an airfield. Um, so it, we automatically can't launch. Um, oh, we, we, we can because our, our um, operator has a, a real licence, so we, we can, but it's just a bit more challenging. It's, yeah, I mean, that's quite interesting because uh, my first experience of, uh, of well, I wasn't actually flying the drone, but uh, of uh, seeing a drone fly, <laughs> fly was a, it crashed into a tree and, and, re, and it was, was relaunched, but the uh, control circuitry was damaged and we didn't realise and we lost complete control of it and it just took off and it was actually in, the, in a flight path. So um, that oh. was pretty scary. Yep. Well, so we were flying. So I had a, one of the Pomona cameras was up underneath a, a relatively heavy lift drone. And unfortunately, a very strong gust of wind came in and the, the camera was on a 40 centimetre offset from the drone. And so that acted as a very nice lever arm, ripped the drone out of the sky, sky crashed the drone and broke it in half and crashed the camera and broke it in half. So it was a fairly expensive morning's, morning's flight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hence the reason we're now using the Mavic to do the, the shots rather than putting up a 360 camera. So is there any other questions? Well, the, the one on the, the bandwidth needed interests me. Um, I've got a 1.5 megabit per second link here at home at the moment. Um, and I actually noticed that the images displayed in the Zoom now work really well. I get essentially still high quality images. Um, I'm wondering, it may be possible to um, create some software that allows um, adjustment of the resolution. And if you wanted to do that, um, the ANU Tech Launcher students each year need projects to do. And no doubt your university will have a similar group of computer science students in these projects. So it might be possible to do it where the student gets a slow scan, high resolution image. And then when they want detail, it would give them video zoomed in, in effect. Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, look, anything that improves, improves that. I guess, because often the question we get with farmers, because 
a lot of farmers have major bandwidth issues because they, they often don't have the same resource and cities have. And I guess the benefit we have is that mostly, um, not entirely, but mostly I'm trying to educate people in the cities. And, and so that does make that a little bit easier, but equally I do want people in rural areas to be able to use it as well. And anything that helps that, given the bandwidth issues going into a lot of rural Australia make, can make a big difference. So that's something I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll look that up. It's, it's a good point. Thanks, Tom. Hey, well, thank you, um, Stuart. I mean, it's a really interesting project and it's great to see. Um, so we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, yep. I'm sure if people have got other questions, they'll, uh, they can email you and, and uh, follow that up. But thank you very much. So we'll um, put, the, put the recording on YouTube if you want to uh, use it for your own you know, e-portfolio or whatever. And um, yeah, let, let's catch up and keep working on projects. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.